welcome to this evening service here in Trimbalg Reformed Presbyterian Church. Uh, the service is going out via YouTube. Let us ask God for his blessing upon us as we gather around his word. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you on this Sabbath evening and we thank you that we can approach your throne of grace and we thank you that we can unite our hearts, Lord, in your worship. We worship you as our creator. We worship you as our sustainer. And Lord, we worship you as the one who is sovereign over all things. Even in these days of the pandemic, we thank you that we can turn to you, your word and find hope and strength and encouragement. We pray that as we think this evening about the church and how the church is portrayed in your word, we pray that we would be encouraged, uh, Lord, in your, in your church. And may we be helped and strengthened for this week that we have entered upon. So we ask your blessing, we ask your forgiveness from all, for all our sins. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our first psalm is Psalm 45, verses 10 to 17. And in this psalm we have a description of the church as the bride of Christ. We find that the bride, having grown to maturity, leaving her home where she was brought up and setting up a new home. And our Lord Jesus uh, expressed how that is a picture of the church, those who are called into a relationship with himself so that, so that they leave behind the old life and embrace new life in Christ. So Psalm 45, singing verses 10 to 17, let us praise God.
scripture reading is taken from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, reading from verse 12, 12 to 27. 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 12. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptised by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body. It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable and the parts that we think are less honourable we treat with special honour. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honour to the parts that lacked it so that, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. We'll end our reading at that 27th verse, we know that God will add his blessing to the reading of his word. Our second psalm is the well-known words of Psalm 23. Psalm 23a version, singing the whole psalm. And in this psalm we have the picture of believers as members of Christ's flock as sheep who follow the Good Shepherd. Psalm 23 is a well-known psalm. And yet when we sing it again or hear it sung, it always encourages us because we know that the, the Good Shepherd will gather all his sheep into the fold, just as the Lord himself will gather all his children into that wonderful place called heaven. So we sing Psalm 23a, 1 to 5. Let us praise God.
Now, just before we turn to the message from God's Word today, we unite our hearts in prayer, asking for the Lord's blessing upon us. Let us pray. Once again, our loving Heavenly Father, we come to the throne of grace. We come, Lord, because you have encouraged us to come your word says clearly that people ought always to pray and not to lose heart. So we pray, Father, that in these days of crisis you would now lift our thoughts and our vision uh, above and beyond the things that are going on around us. That sense of helplessness in the face of the pandemic, that uh, sense that... Uh, Things, Lord, will not soon re get better or return to what was normality. And so we want, Father, to pray especially that you would uh, have mercy upon us and draw near to us and help us in these days. We pray for all in our own congregation, praying that you would keep us safe and uh, we pray also for those, Lord, who have contacted the virus and who are ill, even as we speak. We pray that you would draw near to them and we pray that you would grant them healing. And we pray, Father, also for those who grieve the loss of loved ones. And we pray earnestly again that soon, Lord, a vaccine will be found and uh, Above all, we pray that we might learn the lessons that you're teaching us through this time of crisis. So Lord, he hear this our prayer and encourage our hearts here around your word this evening. We pray for the congregation at the time of visitation as the members of Presbytery uh, address the uh, different aspects of the church's work and witness. We pray that we would be challenged and encouraged and uh, strengthened, O oh Lord, and go forward even more united in our love and in our witness and in our work for you. Now, Father, as we turn to your word, we pray that you would uh, open up for us the word and speak to our hearts. May there be encouragement May there also be challenge to us even this evening. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We turn now to the message from God's Word for us this uh, evening. And uh, as you know, in our morning services, we've been doing a series called Back to Basics, looking at the very spiritual foundations of the church and the very basic things which have to do with the scripture and its teaching on the way of salvation and its teaching about living the Christian life. So we looked already today uh, at the some of the teaching with regard to the Church of Jesus Christ. It's a big subject, but what I want to do this evening is follow on from uh, our study in the morning, and I want us to look this evening at some word pictures, or as we call them, metaphors of the Church. Word pictures of the Church. So I've picked out a few for us just to think briefly about this evening. The first uh, picture is uh, Christ's building. Christ's building. The world today, of course, pictures the church as a physical building. We speak of going to church as going down to a particular building down the road on the Lord's Day, for instance. But as a matter of fact, the word church is never used in the, in the New Testament in the sense of 
a physical building. And yet, it is a building in the spiritual sense. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, writing to the Christians in his day, as living stones, you are being built into a spiritual house. And it's built for a special purpose because the Holy Spirit dwells within it. So here are living stones. Here are people who have been brought to new life. They're being built into a spiritual house, a spiritual house. Uh, a house in which God dwells by his Holy Spirit. So I remind you what Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 19 and following. He says, You're no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises or is rising to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. So Christ's building is a very special building. Again, Paul writes to the Corinthians, Do you not know, he says, that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? So, this is exciting. It's wonderful. Believers are part of the most important building project in the history of the human race. God is building his church it's living stones. It's a spiritual house. It's a house indwelt by the Lord himself. And having begun that work, that building project, he will carry it on until it's completed, until every piece is laid in place. He will finish the work he has begun. So, there's the first picture, Christ's building, the church as Christ's building. But then secondly, we look at the church as Christ's body, the church as Christ's body. Uh, this is one of the most common word pictures for the church in the New Testament. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, from verse 12, we read, you remember, how the church is like a body. And he says there are many limbs in the body. And so there are many limbs in the church of, of Christ. And each limb is joined uh, to other limbs. And uh, no part of the body should look down on any other part because Paul says that every part is needed every part has a contribution it can make God has arranged the parts of the body just as he wanted them to be so we can say today I am what God wanted me to be it may not be what I particularly like or it may be something that I wish was different, but Paul makes it clear. Each part is arranged just as God wanted it to be. Uh, and each part is indispensable, he says. And uh, so you, plural, you believers at Corinth, you are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a limb of it. So, the body of Christ. Uh, the church is the body of Christ. And that speaks to us about a, a living, 
a body is a living organism organically joined to Christ who is the head and uh, it's made up of different limbs that function together under the direction of the head. The instructions come from the head to the different parts and each part is called to work in unity. There is no point in one part of the body, say a hand, touching uh, a hot uh, saucepan in the kitchen and getting the message from the head, don't touch. There's no point in the hand saying, well, why should I bother uh, withdrawing my hand uh, if the uh, effect of being burnt wants to be, uh, is to be overcome then the, the hand must work in unity with the brain and obviously uh, stop touching the part that is being burned. So Paul talks about the church as the body of Christ and we try to show that uh, even at uh, communion. Paul says that the one loaf that we break symbolizes the oneness that we have in the body of Christ, who is the bread of life. So the church is the body with limbs, limbs that function together under the direction of the head. And in that way, there's unity. Uh, so I have to uh, realize that the church is not a group of people chosen by me or by any other person other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He has chosen the particular group of people who make up the body of Christ. And uh, the whole foundation of that, the whole basis of that is not merit that I have earned, but it's by free, unmerited grace, kindness, loving kindness towards someone who was a sinner. So I must do all that I can to uh, resist divisiveness. Paul says, let every part, let every member, let every limb do its work and in that way the unity of the body is maintained yes all the members are different but that is how it's meant to be we are interdependent we need each other if one part hurts Paul says all hurt uh, if one part is uh, the re re receiver of special blessing, then all rejoice. So just as any bo body is meant to grow to maturity of maturity of adulthood, so it is in the church. Ephesians four, thirteen to sixteen. Paul says there. God gave different gifts to the members of his church and that is so he says that the body of Christ verse 12 chapter 4 of Ephesians that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we'll no longer be infants, uh, but speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love 
as each part does its work. So there's our goal. The body coming to full maturity. And there is a great beauty in that. When God has finished his work, uh, it will be truly the, the, the body beautiful. The perfection of the life of the church. And that is something we look forward to in a world that is so corrupt and, and sinful. The church as the body of Christ. Then thirdly, we look at the church as Christ's bride. The church as Christ's bride. What is Christ's purpose or goal in the world well, Paul tells the Ephesians uh, what that is. Ephesians 5, verse 27, where he says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, for the church, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. There we find God's purpose in his choosing of his church, his bride. It seems like a big ask that Someday the church will be like a perfect bride. On her wedding day, of course, a bride wants to be radiant, so she's carefully washed, cleansed, and she's specially clothed, and she's very careful about her complexion. She doesn't want any wrinkle. Uh, or any blemish especially on that big day when there are photographs and so on to be taken so she wants her garments to be without stain Paul says so on that day she wants to be looking at her very best will that goal be replaced will we ever reach a time when the church is perfectly ready for Christ and the, the, some of the parables that Christ told, as you remember, were about the bridegroom coming for the bride. When he comes, will she be radiant without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless? Well, John tells us in Revelation 21, verses 2 to 9, how he sees the bride of Christ, and she is uh, perfect in holiness and purity. So, how wonderful it is that God gives that promise that one day his bride will be perfect. But we ask a, a, a deeper question. Why did God choose his people? Why did he choose those who make up the bride of Christ? Well, You'll remember perhaps from the book of Deuteronomy what Moses had to say to the people of Israel about the way that they were chosen to be God's special people. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. There Moses talks about the Bride of Christ. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. Moses reminds the people, he says to them, Remember that you are a people holy to the Lord your God. One implication of that, he says, is that you must not intermarry with the pagans, with those nations round about, 
who live in rebellion against God every day. No, he says, do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons for they will turn away your sons from following the Lord to serve other gods. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, to be his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he had sworn to your forefathers that he brought out with a mighty hand and redeemed from that the land of slavery from the power of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love. See, there's the uh, relationship between Christ and his church pictured in marriage, in marriage where there is a covenant, a covenant of love, which he will keep to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. So Moses stresses to the children of Israel that it wasn't because they were special. It was not, he says, because you were the largest or the wisest or the most attractive. No. But the Lord set his love upon you. He entered into that wonderful covenant, that covenant that is pictured in the marriage relationship. The Lord set his love upon you because the Lord loves you. Someone maybe says, well, is that really meaningless? The Lord loves you because he loves you. And yet, that's what the Lord says. Again, speaking through Hosea, I will betroth you to me forever. And so he says, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Christ as the bride, chosen by grace, chosen to be his beloved for now and for all eternity. The Lord has set his love upon you. Moses says and it is because he loves you he has made a commitment to you he will never leave you or forsake you Christ's bride but then fourthly we come to think of Christ's big family Ephesians 2.19 you plural are the members of the household of God. The members of the household, that means the family in the house. Second Corinthians 6, verse 18. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Yes, says Paul. Once you were spiritual orphans, but now you have been brought out, brought into the family. You are loved by your heavenly Father. So it's about a relationship with the Lord as our Father, our Father in heaven. Christ taught us to pray. So. The relation speaks, uh, relationship speaks of community, of sharing, of interdependence. In a family we must work together. We cannot always have it our own way. We have to learn how to seek to uh, 
meet the needs of others in the family. And uh, we must make that commitment to seeking to work things out rather than walking away the one from the other. Paul writes to the different churches in the letters to that he's writing to them, stressing again and again, we are family members together. At one time there was a great wall, as it were, separating us, but Christ has broken down that wall, and now we are all one in Christ. So we are Christ's big family as members of Christ, as believers in him. And now the fifth and final word picture. Uh, we are Christ's victorious battalion. Christ's victorious battalion. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, Paul paints a picture which was seen often in the different wars that were fought at that time. And the picture is of the victorious Roman general uh, with his victorious battalions leading the way, marching back into the city from which they had left to war against their enemies. And uh, so the top brass are at the front, the commanders of the battalion, and then we have right down to the ordinary foot soldiers, but then behind them, coming in chains, are the enemy troops and then the enemy citizens who have been defeated and who are being brought into the city. And the crowds of people in that city, so relieved that the victory against their enemies has been won, they would flock out into the city and as the soldiers would march past to the sound of music and drums and celebration they would they would scatter lovely fragrant perfume over the returning soldiers the perfume would fill the air and so what does Paul say Second Corinthians 2 verse 14 thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. So here is that picture you see of the soldiers returning in triumph and there's the perfume filling the air. It reminds us that we're in a war, but uh, it tells us that as Christ's battalion, we are on the winning side. Uh, but we've got to be realists. We've got to put on the armor of God. We've got to take the weapons that have been provided. We've got to use these weapons. And God will give us the victory. Paul says, To us it is the fragrance of life. But to those who were the rebels against the king, it's the fragrance of death. They know that judgment and death and punishment lie ahead. We have been saved from that in Christ and so we press forward knowing that Christ will give us the victory and uh, we seek then to fight the good fight 
and finish the course and keep the faith. So there we have it. Five word pictures, five metaphors of the Church of Jesus Christ. We are Christ's building. We are Christ's body. We are Christ's bride. We are Christ's big family. We are Christ's victorious battalion. May God bless his word to all our hearts. Let us again unite in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Church of Jesus Christ, which has existed all down through the ages. And we thank you that we as members of the true Church of Christ, according to the Scriptures, are Christ's building. We thank you that he is building his church. The gates of hell shall not prevail, but Christ, having begun a good work, will bring it into completion before the great day of Christ. We thank you that Christ has given gifts to his church. We see this in the picture of the body of Christ with the different limbs, each joined the one to the other, each one having their own part to play. Grant, Lord, that there will be unity among, among us as members of Christ's body, that we would not uh, look down on those who may we feel may have lesser gifts, and grant that those who are uh, gifted may not be tempted to pride. Thank you that we are the bride of Christ. Thank you that Christ has promised to be with his bride and to uh, cleanse her so that there will be no spot or wrinkle, but she'll be clothed in that perfect wedding garment. And uh, as the psalmist said, when Christ comes for his bride, she will be taken uh, into the palace of the king forever and ever. Thank you that as members of the family, uh, as members of the bride of Christ, we are family. The old walls of hatred and division are broken down in Christ. And we are all one in him. Uh, we thank you that Christ is victorious. That he will triumph over all his and our enemies. And he will appear uh, in victory to mete out judgment on those who were his enemies. They will not be able to stand. The fragrance of life for us as believers means the fragrance of death for those who reject the King. They will not be able to stand on that great day. So Father, teach us from these word pictures and grant that we would experience something of their reality in our own lives day by day. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Now may the grace of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, be with us all. Amen.